This is Digital Anarchist. Hey everyone, it's Alan Schimmel, Editor-in-Chief of DevOps.com Security Boulevard. And we're coming at you today on our Digital Anarchist platform. Happy to have sort of a surprise video uh, interview with a friend of mine. I'd like to introduce you all to Ali Golshan, who's CTO, Golshan, who's the CTO of StackRock, StackRocks, S-T-A-C-K-R-O-X. Ali, did I get that right? You did, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, Ali, we're going we're gonna to spend the next 20, 30 minutes talking about Kubernetes, containers, and security. But before we do, I, I just wanted to get out of the way. Maybe there's some people in the audience who are not familiar with Stack Rocks. So let, let's take a minute or two and, and kind of put that to rest. Who is Stack Rocks? What do you guys do? And, and we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, so Stack Rocks was founded in January 2015. Um, our main mission has been to build safety for developers and security tooling for security engineers and operators with a specific focus on Kubernetes native control, securing containers and microservices on top of it. Um, so rather than looking at the world through their lowest common denominator, which is you know, containers on top of any orchestrator, we decided to double down and take a look at it and say, well, we think orchestrators are becoming the operating systems of cloud for the future. Which one of these do we think is going to be the dominant one? So we bet on Kubernetes. So we look at ourselves as a Kubernetes native security platform for cloud native solutions. Excellent. Well, that was a good bet in hindsight, right? And <laughs> this is why I'm much better betting in hindsight than making bets beforehand. But uh, you, you pick the right one. Um, but, but seriously, when we look at Kubernetes, you know, I just had this discussion earlier today with someone I was trying to explain to they asked me what is Kubernetes and, and why is it important and I, I tried to explain to them you know VMware spent about five billion dollars last week right on on some acquisitions and so much of what they've spent and so much of the VM world buzz coming out has been their sort of move towards DevOps and Kubernetes right and, and, and when we look at it, you know, what powered the cloud for the last 15 years, let's call it, right? It was the hypervisor. And, and how quick, if you would have told me like this, you know, in the snap of a finger, it's sort of a Thanos snap from the Avengers, right? In, in the, we're going to kind of change the course of history, and it's not the hypervisor that is dominant. It's the container and the container orchestrator that becomes the dominant infrastructure in, in, in the cloud. Um, I would have said you're crazy. Right. This sounds, you know, it doesn't it sounds like a Marvel movie, but but it's true. Right. And I, I wonder, do you have have you guys amassed any findings on just how prevalent Kubernetes has become or, or any kind of the growth around it? Yeah. So I think a good way to think about it is maybe taking a, a step back. And you mentioned this virtualization was really what triggered this entire cloud movement. Um, and I think if you look at until, you know, a few years ago, kind of call it 2013, 2014, majority of the drive around containerization, um, um, virtualization and cloud was still very much focused around monolithic applications. Um, and what I mean by that is, is that you either wanted to run that monolith on prem, you wanted to run in a virtualized environment so you get some additional um, output out of your system system or eventually offload that to the public cloud. Um, what has really driven this now has been this push towards microservices. So Kubernetes' emergence has really been due to the need for building distributed systems that are high availability, high performance, highly scalable, and automated. Um, and this was a big realization where initially I think the move to containerization should be really separated from move to Kubernetes. Um, what I mean by that is if you look at it four or five years ago, developers started to use containers. And I'm a big believer that everything in user space will eventually run in some isolated format. So containers happens to be the current form factor. Um, but containers are a decision that developers or DevOps or engineers generally made as a tool to use. If you think about Kubernetes, Kubernetes is essentially a business decision. You make it as part of your business or digital transformation because it's a huge bet you're making. 
And the reason for yep. this is it affects your developers, your ops, all the way through your security folks. So what we are seeing is really twofold. We're seeing a large class of companies who build on other types of orchestrators because of their scale requirements, for example, Mesos, are now migrating yep. towards Coop. We're seeing any new company that is either building SaaS or building SaaS services for their customers building on top of Coop. And then the other thing is, is we're actually seeing a lot of customers use Kubernetes as part of their management for their edge-based computing and their distributed computing. So what I will say is, is the adoption of Kubernetes is as, is as high velocity as containers but the day-to-day -day impact of it, you're starting to now just see it is because people initially built containers. And then once that got to sort of a density level, now they looked at it and they said, oh, holy crap, how do we actually manage and orchestrate and move all these things around? And that's where Kubernetes came a little bit later, a couple of years after the initial containerization movement. Absolutely. You know, you, you said a lot of things in there that I'd love to kind of pick a, a few that we, we can go deep. So first of all, Let's put Kubernetes to the side for a moment and talk about containers, microservices, chicken or the egg, right? I mean, containers have been around in Linux world for forever. Well, not forever, but for as long as Linux has been around virtually, no pun intended. And, um, you know, but it wasn't until maybe Docker in the last five, six years that we really saw it. And, and granted, I think Docker and, and what Solomon and, and the team, the original team there brought, certainly ushered in this container revolution. But I think part and parcel was that, was that containers were really a great, um, a great architecture moving from monolithic to microservices-based applications right well the, you know so you know what was the chicken what was the egg and, and would you have one without the other probably not um but you know so i i think that kind of set that off but just like everything else i've seen in technology in my 30 years right is we run ahead and do this stuff because there is a good reason for it. It brings some real benefits. And then all of a sudden someone says, gee, what about security, right? And, and oh, oh yeah, there's that security thing again, right? And we, we saw it with the cloud. We saw it with, we, we've seen it at every step of the way from decentralized to centralized client server, et cetera, endpoints, mobile. And, and so container security became sort of a thing let's say four years ago, right? Five years ago tops. And again, just like I've seen in other areas, Ali, the, the first response was, well, we're going to take our security that we already have and we're just going to container wash it or containerize it or whatever you want to use that term. And so it really wasn't that good. I mean, I'm trying to be kind, but it stunk. Right, it was, it was the wrong tool. It was the wrong tool for the job. And as any man will tell you, right? If we're going to get all manly, it's all about the tools. And and so you know, we we saw a tremendous mismatch. And and then again, for a long time, Ali, I I was dismayed where the the conversation around container security seemed to start and end with doing vulnerability scanning, right? Which you know is what I was doing in two thousand and three. And you know, you're going to tell me we haven't you know, advanced the art since then, and this is a different architecture. There's more to be done here than scanning for vulnerabilities. Now, I think, again, chicken and the egg and, and just you know, things come together. Kubernetes gave us some, some meat in which to do security with. Right? It gave us some means. It gave us some infrastructure. You know much more than I talk about. Tell us about it. What, what happened here? Yeah, that's a great point. So the way I think about it is in the context of crawl, walk, run. When you're talking mm -hmm. about initially people using containers, using a lot of traditional tooling and security, that was the crawl stage where I feel like a lot of customers were experimenting with containers. Like, what does Docker do? What does Cryer do? Um, what are all these container technologies enabling my developers to do? So I think... What ended up happening is, especially if you kind of rewind five years ago, those containers were running in limited capacity. 
there may have been a few containers here and there, you know, a couple of dozen at most. Um, even if they were running in production, they were very much nested in your traditional infrastructure. So you still had firewalls and WAFs and IPS, IDS, and EDRs. Um, and because of it, it didn't present the exposure that you thought about. Like the, the amount of impact on your enterprise was relatively low because you weren't running mission critical applications in there. Um, and that presented two things. One, naturally people didn't want to go invest specifically for some low level risk thing as security thinks about. And then the second part of it, which is quite frankly, my issue with the larger security industries is as soon as there's an emerging technology and security, majority of security vendors just look at it as a marketing problem. Oh yeah, of course we cover that. Oh, of course our mm -hmm. products can secure that. Um, which in the case of containers and specifically moving forward Kubernetes and microservices is untrue. You need an entirely different structure uh, architecture because the structure of running applications, immutable, ephemeral, distributed, um, and then introduction of the entire DevOps lifecycle of CI, CD impacted that. So that's kind of, I feel like, where we move from crawl to walk, where companies realize, okay, initially we had some protection around these. Now we realize traditional vendors don't solve this. So what is the low, lowest hanging fruit we have to go solve? And then you touch vulnerability scanning. Um, I'm a huge advocate because I think understanding what vulnerabilities you're introducing into your environment, doing proper image scanning so I understand packages and dependencies and licenses is all very important. Now, the problem here again was that traditional models of vulnerability scanning, either at runtime scanning or traditional static, did not apply to this DevOps cycle. So with containers then came the acceleration of CI CD tooling and the DevOps workflow. So being able to have vulnerability scanners that integrate into my CI CD, into my registry, scan images, fail builds, shift security further left. It was a really great starting point. A couple of companies have done really well around that. And that was kind of, I call it the walk stage. Um, and now here we are at where we're entering that run stage over the next year, uh, which is companies realize you can't use traditional security. It's not just about vulnerability scanning, um, but uh, the tooling you need have to be native to the infrastructure use. So they have to be native to Kubernetes um, or other form factors you use. And they have to be full Cycle. They can't be runtime. They can't just be built. They have to integrate into your build. They have to integrate into your deployment and they have to do things at runtime. Um, and it's that consistency um, where the language or the common language being used is Kubernetes that has kind of brought us to this stage. So I think that's kind of the progression we've seen. Companies went from experiment to run, now truly operationalizing. And that's where Kube containers and the new security form factors are coming in. I agree with you. What's interesting, though, too, is, you know, my experience is in a perfect world, companies opt for less tools, not more tools, right? So when we look at something like security and securing, you know, microservices, containers, and, and uh, Kubernetes, people don't want one security tool for you know, pre-deployment, another to security tool at, po at time of deployment, and yet another security tool post-deployment, right? And if they do, those three tools better have a pretty damn tight integration, right? I, I don't want three different interfaces. I don't want three different languages. I don't want three different, you know, paradigms. And, and so I think it's important that this next generation of, of tools, let's call them Kubernetes native, for lack of a better word right now, or cloud native, Kubernetes native security tools, understand the, the different phases along that software development life cycle, right? And either can, can handle that whole enchilada, the whole, you know, the whole life cycle, or are very, very tightly integrated with tools that go along this. Where's StackRocks in that? Yeah, great question. So. The way I think about this is, is that it's an actual, it's an interesting thought process, right? If you think about it traditionally, especially when we move from monolith to kind of the, the evolution is tr traditional model was developers build, hand it over to ops, ops operationalizes, deploys it, and then security becomes a bunch of gatekeepers. And in this world, um, every company wanted to become your horizontal platform. I want to be the thing you plug into from end to end. Um, and integration was very tough. You know, API driven models were not very common. And obviously now um, with the rise of APIs and RPC, that's hugely, um, hugely advanced that. The way we think about it is, is that, and we actually tell our customers this, which is, is that the way you should think about Kubernetes is 
Kubernetes is that horizontal platform you should force all other vendors to plug into. So nobody should be your workflow. Everybody should build their workflow as part of your Kube, your CI, CD, your DevOps, your SDLC lifecycle. And we take a very similar approach. So when we think about safety across the entire lifecycle of build, deploy, run, we think about different use cases, not different features at every stage. Um, and I think that's a very important part of it because Kubernetes is about operationalization. It's operationalization at scale, which requires automation. So what that means is, is that at the build process, we want to make sure we do image scanning and understand vulnerabilities. Um, but if somebody has their own vulnerability scanner, we plug into the ones they have. We don't have to provide our own. At the deployment stage, we run things like CIS benchmarks for Docker, Kube, NIST, PCI, HIPAA. Um, at runtime, we do configuration management, networking, firewalling, detection. But the key thing is the output of all this information is consumable by Kube itself, the way we produce it. So that's how we think about it. So when we want to make sure at build something happens, we fail to build if there's vulnerabilities you don't want to introduce into production. At deployment time, we use the Kube native constructs like admission controllers or scale to zero if an image is not meant to go out somewhere or if it's violating certain policies. At runtime, rather than, for example, shimming ourselves in as a proxy or in line or between the runtime engine and the host, which causes a lot of operational friction and you become part of critical path, we use things like pod egress ingress policies to program layer three. We use Istio and service mesh for layer seven. Um, we use the notion of killing pods and containers. So all of this is regular constructs and regular motions and workflows. So it's one thing to integrate into Kubernetes, but in my view, being Kubernetes native is more than just integration. It's building your workflow the same way the workflows in Kube and CI CD work. And, and I, I, you're 100% correct. And that's really cloud native versus just integrating into Kubernetes. And, and so that brings up the whole cloud native thing. So for instance, you spoke about service mesh and Istio. There, and we'll hold that up as an example, but there, there's a whole, you know, I tried to explain to someone a couple weeks ago that I, I think of the whole cloud native computing foundation, you know, Kubernetes gets an inordinate amount of, of the press around it. But it, it's kind of like, you know, an American naval fleet where the aircraft carrier, right, is, is the, the flagship. But there's, there's more to a fleet than an aircraft, right? There's battleships and destroyers and cruisers and frigates and submarines, support ships, amphibious landing ships. We, we see all of these in the cloud native world, right? And, and some, of them, some of them, you know, directly support that Kubernetes mission. Some of them sort of exist in their own, you know, independent of Kubernetes, if you will. But a couple of things. Number one, strictly from a passion point, passion and buzz point of view within the, the IT community, including developers, DevOps, security folks, look, this is where the excitement is. This is where people want to play, right? This is where innovation is happening. And then secondly, as a result of all this innovation and passion, we're, we're seeing like internet time crunched even tighter, if you will, right? Things are happening, boom, boom, boom. I mean, it's, it's hard to keep up. I can't wait to get to, to San Diego in November for the next Cloud Native Con just to see what I missed, you know? Um, well, what, you know, what, what's next? And that's great, but I got to imagine for Stack Rocks, you're, you guys are saying, wow, you know, it's good because we have a blueprint going forward, but my goodness, we, we've got to keep our, our tails in, in, you know, in this and keep moving as fast as we can to keep up with this. Talk about some of these challenges. Yeah, so I think, you know, when you, when you talk about Cloud Native Computing Foundation, there, there is a lot more to it than Kube. You're talking about things like Prometheus and Envoy, Core DNS, Container D, a lot of other tooling that yeah. exists in there. The best way to think about this is, is that this ecosystem is meant to, is meant to um, accelerate cloud native adoption and tooling that is required to do this from building to monitoring to servicing to managing across the board. So each one of these is, is important to look at 
from the standpoint of what is the use case? What is the value you're trying to add to your business? Um, and the reality of it is you may not need a lot of this, um, or some of it may not be necessarily relevant for your business. So the way we look at it at Stack Rocks is, is that we kind of look at our mission. You know, our long-term goal is, is securing distributed systems, you know, whether they're running on using a container or a serverless function, on-prem, multi-cloud, public cloud, it doesn't matter. However, our focus is Kubernetes and a Kubernetes service mesh because we want to secure this new cloud operating system. So the way we think about this is, you know, I'm a big believer that in enterprise, there's no such thing as being a visionary. You know, there's this understood set of problems. If you solve those problems the right way, the customers will naturally pay you for it. And then you can scale that and they'll solve, you know, ask you to solve additional problems. Um, you can not suddenly come up with something really interesting that solves no particular purpose. Right. So under that context, our general trajectory is relatively clear. We know what we want to do. We know we want to make the lives of developers easier. We want to know, we, we, we know that we want to make sure they use their native tools. So if we alert on things, they consume it through things like Slack or Jira or PagerDuty. When we write policies, we're writing them using open, you know, policy agent, um, OPA, um, or using YAML um, that is um, native to Kubernetes. Um, so the biggest thing we talk about is lack lock-in because if we design things that forces a proprietary model for us those proprietary components are naturally by my experience the things that come in and end up being a dead end for you because a new technology is built that extends on some open source function or some construct so we look at it and we say okay if we want to operationalize developers if we want to give security folks the right tools um, and if we want to be able to scale this using the existing constructs what are the use cases we want to center around so that naturally positions us saying, okay, we want to understand visibility, compliance, configuration management, detection, response, networking. So if you break each one of those categories down, then you can look at the CNCF foundation and look at the tools that contribute to each one of those use cases. And the way we approach it is we say, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to build layer three segmentation controls because it exists in Kubernetes pod policies. Um, we don't want to create, for example, killing system calls that are unnatural when we can run as a daemon set and kill pods or containers. So in that world, we build, we add value where there's a gap we see, and we leverage the existing infrastructure and tools um, where they are available. And the typical model we've taken is, is, I call it kind of the infinite versus the finite business decision making, is, is that we look at our company as a long-term build. So if we know you know, Kubernetes.io is releasing a feature set for networking or SDO is coming out with something in nine months. Rather than going and building that and trying to commercialize that in a shorter term, we wait for that and help operationalize that the right way, the safe way, the secure way once it's introduced. Because that way, we also tell our customers, listen, our interests are aligned. Because if you at one point don't see value in the product, you can rip us out and all that logic, all those rules and heuristics are written into your infrastructure, into Kube. There's nothing proprietary, there's no lock-in. So we are kind of partnered to make sure we both get value out of this. That's fantastic. And that, that's being a good community member, right? And, and, and that's one of the, I, I, I will tell you, I had this conversation yesterday with a, a C-level person at a, a large company that was just acquired actually. and. You know, we've moved from, the, even in open source, which all this cloud native stuff is, right? We've moved from, let's call them the Richard Stallman years, right? Where, where it was kind of anarchy, if you will, and, and the heck with Big Brother. to And then we moved into a period where Big Brother ran open source, right? Every open source project had a benefactor, manager, who contributed 99% of the code and was exploiting it for commercial gain. And now we've moved to the age of the foundation. And it really kind of represents democratization, if you will, right? Where, where it's, it's spread out among a larger group of vendors, individuals, and users. And, and if you're just like, you know, in any democracy, if you, if you follow the norms of society and within the rules, you you can not only flourish but you help make it a better a better world right and this is a better foundation i i'd be remiss to mention that you know i'm, I'm pretty involved with the cdf the uh, continuous delivery foundation which is a sister organization to cncf <coughs> and, it, and it's a similar thing there and by the way i i 
I don't know how involved or up to speed on you are on CDF Alley, but there are security challenges there too. They're not necessarily Kubernetes specific, though more and more we're seeing Cube, Kube, you know, dominate there as well, right? In the in the CI C D tools. So, you know, we're gonna see the same sort of thing there. What do you see from Stackrack's point of view for that? So this is an area where we're, we're really interested in eager. If you kind of think about our, our product offering, you know, 50, 60%, like definitely more than half of the features and values and offerings we have are about integrations into the CI CD, the build deployment stage. Um, and that's a really interesting component for a couple of reasons I'll touch on and why I think the um, CDF is very important is first of all, for security, I think security has always struggled. Um, to do things like enforcement and blocking. And the reason I say that is, is that security always lived in what I call a probabilistic world. You know, I have this application running. I don't have any context of who built it, when they built it, how they build it, all that asset and inventory information you need. I'm running it in this environment. These are the users that have access to it. This user is the highest risk user. This user now touches these services at every hop you basically decreased your probability about some action. And as a result of it is we kind of got into this cycle where people were saying, okay, well, you're not high enough confidence. I can't enforce this. If I can't enforce it, I can't take action on it. If I can't automatically take action, I can't scale it. This was a very traditional problem that existed with security. Um, now, if you kind of now look at what we're talking about, especially as part of CI CD, there's a number of things that I think are very interesting here. Um, starting from the static code analysis side of things. So integrations into things like GitHub and GitLab, um, integrations into your build processes, into your image registries. The reason for this is, is that at this stage of the process, before you're actually running an application, whether it's containerized, whether it's serverless, however way you're running it, is you have the opportunity as a security operator to treat all of this as infrastructure as code. Infrastructure as code is declarative information. It's binary. You understand if something has privilege or if it doesn't. It has a dependency or it doesn't. Now, the reason this is very interesting to security and why we decided to go full life cycle and, and invest on the CI, on the CD, and the build side of things is, is that in my opinion, this is where you can go from probabilistic to deterministic security. I understand all the characteristics and all the attributions of my application now that it's running. If I have deterministic security, I can automate it. I can take actions, I can respond to it, I can send that information back to the developer for hardening that application. So if I go from probabilistic to deterministic, I can automate. If I automate, then I can scale. So this is where I think is the huge value coming out of the CI CD process of integrations into GitLab and GitHub and build tools, because you can collect all this asset and inventory information and progress security from probabilistic to deterministic. So you can automate and scale it at its core. That's really what we're trying to do at stack rocks. We went kube native because we wanted to have access through kube and through this build process to all this declarative information. So we can make security deterministic to automate it for users and to be able to scale it. And at the same time, for developers, put into their regular workflow, to their build process, to their tooling, to their ticketing solutions, not forcing them in the traditional security way to always go to this single pane of glass model. Excellent. Ali, we, we can talk all day, but I think we're coming up on 30 minutes. Uh, I want to thank you for taking time out of your day. I know you guys are running as fast as you can, as as a, as many in our audience absolutely we're gonna we're gonna call it a, a wrap on this one but we're gonna try to record another one with you soon Allie. and in that one i i want to kind of peel the layers back of the onion a little bit about you know cube native and container security and let's really talk about what stack rocks does in there and not just specific to stack rocks but to to you know generically what what do we talk what are the challenges in this Kube native security world, right? And, and and what we can do. But we'll we'll catch that on the next one. For now, Ali Gulsh and CEO Stack Rocks. Hey, thanks for being our guest here at DevOps. It's DevOps Chat, but with a video twist on Digital Anarchist. This is Alan Schimmel for DevOps.com, a Security Boulevard Container Journal. You've just uh, hopefully enjoyed another DevOps Chat video, and we'll speak to you soon. <laughs>